In this video, we'll be learning how to do derivations in sentential logic. Derivations is a formal mechanical skill that allows us to show that an argument is valid or invalid. Uh, the way we do this is using sort of a very formal structure, using rules, and so on, which we'll cover in today's video. Now, we already know one technique in how to show that an argument is valid, and that's using a full truth table. But the problem is a full truth table is very impractical. Uh, once we start having lots of atomic letters and we have lots of premises, uh, our truth table sort of expands beyond what we could presumably ever do by hand. Now, it's true computers can use truth tables, but it turns out that the derivation is a really nice and easy way for us to do this sort of same end goal, which is to determine validity. Now, fundamentally, a derivation is made up of uh, three things, and three, three things that we really need to cover in today's lecture and become comfortable with. First, we need to know all the rules that we are allowed to use. Uh, we need to know also what derivation types are allowed, and finally, we just have to have a good grip on the basic structure of a derivation. Now, I'm just going to be presenting the material uh, in sort of aggressively and showing you all the things you need to know, but really the best way to understand a derivation is by doing lots of examples and seeing lots of examples. So we'll try and push forward and get to the examples as quickly as we can. So the first thing we're covering is uh, rules. Now, rules are uh, basically their argument forms. They're like mini valid arguments that we allow ourselves to use. And a derivation rule is just a sort of special type of a valid argument that we consider sort of to be very natural or very common, so they're not very controversial. We're never going to prove that a rule uh, is valid. Uh, that's something we'll talk about in class. Um, so in what follows when I present the rules, we'll see that we use the lowercase letters phi and psi to represent any atomic or molecular formula. So what this is sort of meant to show is that a rule works for any sort of substitution, and we'll talk about valid substitutions soon. So the first rule that we're going to look at is modus ponens, and modus ponens is the most sort of talked about and famous derivation uh, rule that is available, and it's a perfectly valid deductive inference pattern. So modus ponens says that if I have a conditional statement, so here I have phi arrow psi, and I also have the antecedent phi, then it's reasonable for me to conclude the uh, truth of the consequent, which is psi. Now we've seen modus ponens many times before. Uh, the classic example that we used was if it's raining, then the sidewalk is wet. Well, if we know it's raining, then we can conclude that the sidewalk is wet. So then now we know that this general inference pattern is called modus ponens. Uh, the second rule that we'll learn is modus tollens, and modus tollens is also a conditional rule. So if we start with a conditional statement, uh, phi arrow psi, and we know the negation of the consequent, so we know not psi, we can affirm the negation of the antecedent, uh, or we can conclude the negation of the antecedent. Again, from our examples, this says if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet, but it's not raining, well then I know that sorry, it's the sidewalks are not wet, then I know that it's not raining. Modus ponens and modus tollens are the two deductively valid rules that we can use for a conditional statement. Now, it turns out that there are two common mistakes used with a conditional all the time, and these are very common fallacies. So the first one we'll look at is deny the antecedent, which says if we have a conditional and we know that the antecedent is false, we can conclude that the consequent must be false too. Well, that's actually uh, no good, that's bad reasoning. And uh, we've seen examples before, but here's a Dilbert comic which is uh, sort of illustrating the point. So here, Catbert is saying that if you leave the company, then that means that you must have been a top performer in the company. Well, Dilbert didn't leave, therefore he's not a top performer. But of course this isn't fair, because uh, just because he didn't leave doesn't actually necessarily mean he's not a top performer at all. And that's what Dilbert is saying. The second fallacy is affirming the consequent. So if we have a conditional statement and we know that the consequent is true, well then lots of people think we can infer that the antecedent is true as well. We've looked at examples of this fallacy. Uh, if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. Well, the sidewalks are wet. Does that mean it's raining? Actually, no, it doesn't. It could be a variety of things, like someone's just washing their sidewalk, for example. So affirming the consequent is also an invalid uh, inference pattern. So we're going to start with uh, two other rules, and then we'll get to sort of the structure of derivation. Our next two rules are very straightforward. The first is double negation. Double negation basically says that something with two negation signs in front is equivalent to having none, and vice versa. So this rule allows us to move from the negate, double negation of any sentence to just the sentence itself. 
uh, and sometimes you actually do want to go the other way. And the last rule that is always available in our system is repetition. Now repetition is sort of an odd rule in that it doesn't seem to be doing anything important for us, but we'll see that it's uh, actually required for particular reasons later on. And it just says, if you ever know something, well then you can say that you know that thing. So if I know phi, then phi must follow from that knowledge. So those are the first four basic rules. Uh, we will learn six more basic rules uh, soon, and those are the rules that will uh, allow us to work with other connectives like conjunction, disjunction, and biconditional. So remember that when we use these rules, uh, they are what are called valid instance forms, and uh, that these rules need to be interpreted as literally as possible. So any good application of a rule is called a valid instance. And uh, we'll look at some of these valid instance and invalid instances now. So here's an example of what someone might think is a rule. And the question is, uh, which rule did I use here? And is it a valid instance form? Well, so when I look at the, the, cons or the conditional that I start with, the antecedent is P or not R, and the consequent is Q and not bracket P arrow S, close bracket. And then the second premise in my argument is that I have P or not R. And so the question is, can I properly conclude QN not P bracket, sorry, bracket P arrow S? And it seems that this is a clean instance of modus ponens. I have a conditional, I have the antecedent, so I can conclude the consequent. And that's right. There's nothing wrong with this. This is a valid uh, form of modus ponens. How about this one? Q and P arrow S. Well, I know also that I have the P, which is the antecedent of P arrow S. So the question is, can I conclude S? Uh, well, remember, rules need to be taken literally, and modus ponens and modus tollens only operate on conditionals. So it looks like what I'm doing is actually legitimate. It looks like I have the conditional statement P arrow S, and I know P, therefore S. And the fact that I know Q and is not that big of a deal. But it turns out that this is not a valid instance form. And in fact, doing this is not allowed in our logical system. And we'll sort of see lots of examples of why this is, uh, how this works later on. So this, although it looks like a modus ponens, is an invalid use of the rule and is not allowed. How about this? Not bracket S or P, arrow not R, R, therefore S or P. Now the rule that it seems I'm appealing to here is a modus tollens, because the consequent of my conditionals not R, and I, have, I also know R, which is surely the negation of the consequent, and then so I can infer the negation of the antecedent, which is S or P. And it's so, it, although it looks like modus tollens, in fact, this is actually no good. We are not allowed to apply the rule in this way. The reason why is because the modus tollens rule literally says that I need the negation of the consequent. So what is the consequent in this case? Uh, the consequent is just not R, the negation of R. So if I literally need the negation of the consequent, it's not R that I would need to apply modus tollens. It's negation, negation R. OK. Well, what if I had negation, negation R? Could I then conclude using modus tollens S or P? And again, the answer is no. It seems like I might be able to, because the result of a modus tollens is the negation of the antecedent. But the antecedent is literally not bracket S or P. So what I would actually infer from an application of modus tollens would be negation, negation, S or P. So here's a final example, uh, not P arrow, not bracket S arrow Z, and I have the double negation of S arrow Z. Can I conclude not not P? And in fact, yes, I can. So this is the good version, essentially, of modus tollens that I was trying to do uh, in the example above. What about this? Uh, negation, negation, bracket, not P or not X. Can I conclude not P or not X? Well, surely I can. This is just a nice, clean example of double negation. Uh, I have the double negation of some complicated molecular statement, and then I can just peel them away. No problem. And how about this? Well, again, this sort of looks like an application of double negation. I have P by conditional negation, negation Q. Can't I just infer P by conditional Q? And again, it turns out that I cannot do this. 
The reason why is the double negation rule, literally speaking, says that I have to have my negations in front. And I can only do double negation if my sentence starts with two negations, like in the top example. So that's basically how to do the rules, but we need to know how, how a rule looks like in a proof. Uh, so I'm going to breeze through some of these concepts, but really the best way to learn is just to look at the examples. And uh, we'll sort of see how uh, a proof actually sort of falls apart using its structure. Okay, so what does a proof actually look like? Well, a proof looks like this. Uh, a proof basically is comprised of three columns. The leftmost column is just the line numbers. These are just there to help you keep organized, and so we can reference particular lines in the proof as we go on. The middle column uh, is where we actually write our symbolic sentences. So anything that should appear in the middle column is a nicely formed symbolic sentence, uh, and the only other thing that we can ever have in the middle column is the word show. Uh, we will explain what show means later. And then in the rightmost column, you have your justifications. Now in your justifications, you can write notes to yourself, but typically a justification line is where you explain how you arrived at the symbolic sentence in the line you're working on. Now you'll notice some sort of other odd things about this, uh, like I have coding like PR number, line number rule, what is a DD, we'll get to all these things soon. Now the two other components of a derivation are boxes and uh, basically crossing off. So here's an example of a box. This is not a complete box. If you wanted to do a full four-sided box, of course that's no problem. Um, but in a derivation we'll often box off lines when we have succeeded in doing something. And the other thing we do in derivations is we cross off the show line. And again we'll talk about what that means soon. So four components of a proof then line numbers, symbolic sentences, boxes, and I also mention indentation here, uh, and then the fourth is justifications. Now it's the justifications that is actually the really important one, and it's what we're going to sort of talk about going forward. And justifications can come in three types. The first is, if you ever have a proof of an argument, sorry, a proof of a validity of an argument, that means you have premises and a conclusion. So one thing you're always allowed to do as a justification line is to repeat one of the premises that you have. Okay. Another thing that you're always allowed to do in a justification line is to use one of the rules that we have. So, so far we only have four rules. Modus ponens, modus tollens, double negation, and repetition. Now, when we use a rule, we don't actually have to write out the entire thing. We just write out the short form of the rule. So modus ponens is MP, modus tollens, MT, and so on. Uh, and then we would have to reference the lines that we use the rules. So we'll uh, talk about that soon as well. And then the last type of justification that we can have is a direct derivation. Now direct derivation is basically an indicator that we've arrived at the conclusion we wanted to prove in the first place. Okay, so what does this all mean? Let's do a couple examples and uh, we can see if we can put everything together. Here's a typical derivation. What it's asking you to do is show that from the truth of the four premises that the conclusion S follows. So premise one is P arrow Q, premise two is R arrow not Q, premise three is not S arrow R, and premise four is P. Remember, premises are things that we just get to assume are true, and then we want to show lead to something, in this case, S. Now, a derivation always starts with a show line. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to state my desired goal of the proof. And my desired goal is to show that S follows from the truth of my premises. So I want to show S. Now what I can do now is look around and try and see how I can combine my premises into being able to do something. So I should notice right off the bat that premise 1 is a conditional, P arrow Q, and premise 4 is P. It's the antecedent of this uh, conditional. So what I can do now is I can actually state my premises. So there's my symbolic line, and I'll say that that's premise 1. And I'll also state P, and that is premise 4. Now the reason why I do this is because now I can do a modus ponens. I can see that I have the antecedent here of this conditional, and I can infer Q. How did I get that? That's line 2 and 3 combined to use modus Components. Now, of course, that makes a lot of sense because this is a conditional. I have the antecedent, so I can infer the consequent. Okay, well, now what can I do? Well, I've sort of taken care of premise 1. I've used premise 4. What about premise 2 and 3? 
Uh, I look around and I say, oh, there is something I can do. It looks like premise two, I have R, L, not Q, and I have Q over here. It looks like I can do a modus tollens. So I will write R, arrow, not Q, and that's premise two. And now I look to try and do my modus tollens. Why? Because modus tollens is the negation of the consequent. I can infer the negation of the antecedent. Now be careful. I don't actually have the negation of the consequent here. This is not Q. What I really need is not not Q. But I can arrive at that very simply by taking line 4 and double negating it, which is a rule uh, that we have. I can always double negate anything I want. Now this is nice because 5 and 6 combine to get uh, a modus tollens which results in the negation of the antecedent, and so that's 5, 6, modus tollens. Okay, what can I do with this not R? Well, I see that I can copy down this premise here, not S arrow R, and that's premise 3. I can modus tollens line 7 and 8. So 7 is the negation of the consequent of line 8, and so when I modus tollens, I get not not s. Again, be careful here. I don't get s, I get not not s. And that's uh, 7, 8 uh, modus tollens. So in the end, I just did a bunch of automatic moves. I did a lot of modus ponens, modus tollens, double negations, and so on. Now, what was I doing? Well, I'm not so sure. I was just sort of showing how all the premises combined. And ultimately, I ended up with not not s which of course I know is just s by the double negation rule again. So here I use double negation to add two negations, here I used it to take away. Now, whenever I'm done uh, sort of running through my automatic moves, I always want to look at my most recent show line. And my most recent show line says that I'm trying to show s, and I've arrived at s here now. So what I say is, hey, from my premises, I actually did arrive at S, and that's exactly what I wanted to show. So on line 10, I successfully did a direct derivation. I showed exactly what I want, which was S. I box everything that led to that derivation, and I now cross off the show. Crossing off the show signifies that I've successfully done what I set out to do, and I did successfully show that S follows from my premises. This is a complete derivation. Every single line is boxed in or is a crossed off show. Every single line has an annotation and we did exactly what we were hoping to do. Let's look at another example. This is also very straightforward but I'll just set up, move through it a little more quickly uh, trying to get you used to the basic structure and how a derivation is supposed to look. So again, I have four premises and I'm just trying to show negation, negation, z. So I write right off the bat that I'm trying to show the conclusion. Now, a lot of people will annotate this as show conclusion, and I could have done that in the first proof as well. On line two now, I just start to combine things. Well, what can I do? Uh, can this y be combined here? It might be tempting to try modus ponens, but that won't work because uh, this is sort of bound on the inside. So I'm going to look at this w, and sure enough, I can take the w and double negate it. Uh, so let's actually just do this in one move, and what I'll say is I took premise 4, and I double negated it, and I got not not w. Why did I do that? Well, it's because I see that that's the negation of the consequent here, so now I can write out not x arrow not w, and say that's premise 3, and I will now run a modus tollens to get 2, 3, mt, and that results in not not x. Okay, with not not x, I can ask what can I do now? Well, it looks like I can do a modus ponens here, but first I just need to get rid of those double negations, so that's easy for double negate, and now I can combine line 5 with premise 2 and do a modus ponens. So I'm going to do that now, and I get uh, y arrow z. And that's line 5 combined with premise 2, modus to ponens. Okay, finally, I notice that I do have a y, that's premise 1, and now I can do a modus ponens with line 6 and 7 to get z, and that's 6, 7, 
modus ponens. Now again, I just did a lot of automatic moves. I didn't really show much thinking here, but the key is now, after I just do a bunch of modus ponens and modus tollens, I realize that I'm trying to show double negation z, I have z, so I'm really close. So I'll just double negate line 8, like so, and on line 10, I will say, hey, on line 9, that's exactly what I wanted. I did a direct derivation. I showed directly that my premises lead to exactly the conclusion I wanted. I can now box and cross off the show, and that is a completed derivation. A very important concept to know when you're doing derivations is that of available lines. So available lines are basically things that you can actually use in your derivation. So you can't use anything. For example, you just can't make up random symbolic sentences that you can insert into your derivation. Uh, and, you, uh, and, and there are other sort of interesting rules about what you can and can't use. So fundamentally, here's what is considered an, avail an available line. You can always, always use the premises of your argument at any point in a derivation. Uh, you can also always use any unboxed line that is not a show line. Remember, the reason why is because a show line isn't actually something you have already. It's something that you're hoping to eventually show in a, a part of your proof. So you can't actually use something that you're trying to show. Uh, that would actually be begging the question, and it would create a circular argument. Now, of course, if you ever completely successfully box off uh, sorry, cross off a show line, and it's not in a box, then that line is actually good, because it's like the show isn't there, and it's just a regular, available, unboxed line. So, how do we know if we're ever done a derivation? Uh, well, a derivation is complete in a pretty mechanical way. Uh, if every single show line is successfully crossed or cancelled, uh, then that's a key step. All lines that aren't show lines will need to be in a box. And finally, you need to make sure that you always have a justification for every line. You can't have a derivation where some of the justifications are blank. Now, you can imagine that some of these proofs will actually be quite long. And it's not uncommon to have derivations 20, 30, even 40 lines uh, long. However, there are lots of ways to take shortcuts to make a proof uh, nice and tidy and shorter than uh, it could be in the sort of the full length of it. Uh, these shortcuts or abbreviations aren't necessary, and at first I wouldn't actually recommend you use them, but you'll see that eventually you'll just use them very naturally. And I would only suggest integrating shortcuts and abbreviations once you're very comfortable with the rules and how a derivation works in general. So some examples of abbreviations we can use, we can just drop certain unnecessary annotations, like we don't actually have to write show conclusion. Uh, it's sort of obvious that from writing the show line, so we don't need to do that. Uh, we don't ever actually really need to restate the premises. And actually, from this point forward, you will never see me restating the premises because it's sort of just a waste of time. Uh, we don't need new lines to say direct derivations, uh, and the reason why is because it turns out we can actually do multiple moves at once. And again, I would only recommend doing this if you're comfortable and you see the moves automatically. Let's do an example of another derivation where I make use of abbreviations to shorten the proof. Again, all derivations start with a show line where I'm trying to show the conclusion, and I want to show from the truth of the premises that the conclusion follows. Now the first abbreviation I'm going to make use of is I'm not ever going to bother relisting my premises in my proof. As you saw in the previous example, sometimes I will refer to the premise directly in my justification. In fact, now I'm going to always do that. So let's look at our first sort of obvious thing we can do. Over here I have not s, and over here I have t arrow s. So I realize that I have the negation of the consequent. Always just how to hunt around and look for these things. So I have the negation of the consequent of a conditional, I can immediately modus tollens, and I get not t. How did I do that? Premise 2, uh, premise 4, modus tollens. So you should notice I didn't write show con conclusion here, I didn't repeat my premises, I referred to them directly, I even dropped the little r, that's fine, and I get not t. Now, not t, uh, I can insert uh, and sort of use with this t over here, because t is in the consequence spot, and I have the negation of it. So that's great. Now I can actually just do modus tollens. But I'm going to realize something. If I modus tollens this, I get negation, negation, bracket, p arrow not q. Well, I can actually just shortcut this to say p arrow not q. And how did I do this? I took line 2, I took premise 3, and I did a modus tollens. But that modus tollens results in negation, negation, p arrow not q. So what else did I do? 
I did a double negation. And this allows me to shorten my proof by one line. Now I have p arrow not q, and notice p arrow not q is the antecedent over here. So I know I can just run a straight clean modus ponens and I get not r arrow s. And this is three premise one modus tollens. So we're almost done. Uh, now I want to get my R somehow, but I have this S. Okay, no problem. I see that I have not S over here. That's the negation of the consequent. I can do modus tollens, which will yield not not R, but again, I'm just going to shortcut and I'll say R. How did I get that? For premise two, modus tollens, which gave me not not R, then I did a double negate. Now, as a final shortcut, I will say, hey, Look, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to show R, and now I actually have R, so I don't need another blank line. I can just say on, on this line, I successfully did a direct derivation. I cross off the show, box everything, done. This is a five-line proof that without shortcuts, well, you probably extend another three or four lines. But I hope you see how abbreviations can be quite helpful in making things fast. Once you start getting used to the derivations, uh, you might sort of ask, what is it that you're actually doing? Uh, well, remember, what we're trying to show is that an argument is valid. We're trying to show that from the truth of the premises, that the conclusion actually follows. And that's why we can assume the premises are true, and we are able to use the premises whenever we want. Now, the type of derivation we're doing is what's called a direct derivation. That's how we've been indicating we're done every single time. And a direct derivation basically says, I was able to show that from the truth of my premises, the conclusion follows immediately, and I was able to show it in a direct fashion. It turns out that lots of proofs, in fact, probably the majority of proofs, aren't actually direct derivations. And this is actually reflective of the fact that the majority of arguments that we make in regular English, and especially in philosophy, also aren't direct. Uh, we use lots of different types of reasoning, like conditional reasoning, and uh, indirect reasoning. And it turns out that our derivation system is powerful enough to do these types of uh, derivations as well. So a conditional derivation we use when we're trying to show a statement uh, that is of the form phi arrow psi. Basically, when the conclusion that we're trying to draw is a conditional statement. And the way we prove a conditional is actually by assuming that the antecedent is true, and then we want to prove that from that assumption, under that assumption, that the consequent actually follows. And this type of reasoning happens all the time, and it's often called hypothetical reasoning. So we can see examples of this in philosophy. Uh, Descartes and his famous argument for I think, therefore I am, uh, actually is making some sort of conditional argument here. He's saying that if I actually assume that it's possible, for me to be massively deceived and deluded. Then, what can I conclude? Now, Descartes doesn't actually believe that he's being massively deceived by an evil genius. He just says, if I am massively being deceived by an evil genius, what happens? Well, then he goes through this argument form and he can conclude that I must exist. So his ultimate argument is that if I'm being massively deceived, I still exist. And that is actually hypothetical reasoning to infer a conditional statement. So what does a conditional derivation look like? Um, it looks like this. Uh, we want to show phi arrow psi. Now remember, what we do is we assume the truth of the antecedent. So we just get to assume uh, phi is true. And so on line two, we actually have the assumption CD, which indicates to us that we're starting a hypothetical or a conditional type of derivation. And my goal is that under that assumption, I want to show that the consequent follows, psi. Now, if somehow I can show that psi follows, I will successfully actually show that phi arrow psi makes sense, because under the assumptions phi in line 2, psi follows. So what will the subderivation for psi actually look like? Well, it's just sort of a regular derivation. We have line numbers and rules and so on, and eventually we'll somehow show psi in some, say, direct way. But we'll worry about that later on. But once I show psi, I am able to uh, box it and cross off my show line on line three, because on line six, I said, hey, look, I was able to show psi. Now, how do I close off the entire derivation? How do I finish it now? Well, what I'm able to do is on a new line, line seven, for example, I could say, hey, look, uh, 
On line 3, I successfully showed that the consequent followed, and I showed that the consequent followed from the assumption of my antecedent. Therefore, on line 3, I've actually finished a conditional derivation. I can box off everything and say I have successfully shown phi arrow psi. In this derivation, I'm trying to show that a conditional statement RRS follows from two premises. So, like any derivation, we always start with a show line, and we write out exactly what it is that our conclusion is. I could write show conclusion here, but I'm going to skip it. Now, because I'm trying to show a conditional, I embark on hypothetical reasoning, or conditional reasoning. That means that I will assume the truth of the antecedent. Assume CD. And I will try and show from the truth of the antecedent that the consequent follows. So I'm actually showing the consequent of my original show line. This opens up a new sub-derivation for S. And now I just sort of need to look around and see what can combine. Well, I take a look and I see that I have not R over here, and I just have plain old R over here. Well, that's nice because that's the negation of the consequent. I just need to make it exactly the negation of the consequent, which means I need to take a double negation of line 2. So 2 double negate. Now from here, I can just modus ponens, sorry, modus tollens, but I'll take a shortcut and I'll also do a double negation at the same time. So 4 premise 2 modus tollens, which would give me not not t, but then I double negated it to get t, and that's no problem. From here, I can modus ponens with premise 1 and line 5 to get s, and that is premise 1, 5, modus ponens. Now, of course, I realize that this s is exactly what I want over here, so I can just say direct derivation. Remember that you're always working in the show line that is presently open. Here, there's two show lines, r, arrow, s, and s, but I always want to be working on the one that I'm directly under. So I don't even worry that my ultimate goal is to show r, arrow, s. I focus on showing s, which I have done. So I get to box and close because I said I did that using a direct derivation. And now I have S. S is now an available line, so 3 I'm able to use if I want to. And of course, I do, because I wanted to show R arrow S under the assumption of R. I was able to do sh uh, that and show the consequent S. So now I can say, hey, look, on line 3, I'm doing a conditional derivation, because I'm saying that under R, I showed S, therefore R arrow S is true, and that is a conditional proof. Now, conditional derivations uh, can sort of come in a variety of forms, but um, one thing to sort of know is that we can actually sort of adjust how we approach things in terms of when we do what. So, what that means is that in this example, I can just write show w arrow not x. And then on line 2, well, I could actually immediately assume CD and so on and follow the derivation structure, but I might just realize, hey, there's an automatic move that I should do right here. I have Z arrow Y, I have Z, surely I should just modus ponens this and this is nice and safe. And this is actually totally fine. I can immediately just say premise 2, premise 3, modus ponens, and I get Y. And that's actually sort of like a very simple, nice thing to do. Now, at this point, if I want to, which I do, I can say, okay, well now I'll assume CD, and now I'll assume the antecedent, and I want to show not X. But again, I might realize, hey, before I show not X, um, I can actually just do something really nice and easy. W can combine with premise 1 uh, really quickly to get a modus ponens, and I get X arrow not Y. And that's from line 3, premise 1, modus ponens. And then I might actually also realize that this y is just the negation of this, and so I will use uh, my handy abbreviation skills to say that I took line 2, I double negated it, and then I took line 4, and I used a modus tollens to get not x. Now this is sort of interesting. I assume cd here in line 3 to get the w, and I know I could have written right here show not x. But I didn't bother. I just kept doing automatic moves. And in the end, I actually ended up exactly with what I wanted, not x, even though I didn't write it over here. That's actually perfectly okay. And now what's sort of neat is on line 6 I can say, hey look, line 5 is 
the end of my conditional derivation. I was actually able to show that under the assumption w, I was able to get not x, and I can close it here. So what I just did was a shortcut. It's not a necessary shortcut. I could have inserted my show not x over here, and then eventually gotten not x down here, and then said a direct, direct derivation, and then close the conditional derivation a line later. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is sometimes uh, just happens where just in doing a bunch of automatic moves you actually end up with the consequent that you wanted in the first place and what I'm trying to show you here is that's fine. This conditional derivation structure is totally okay. So remember when you do a conditional derivation you assume the truth of the antecedent and then what you're trying to always show is that the consequent follows either explicitly by writing a show line or sometimes you just get it. Once you do that, you are able to close using a conditional derivation, and that is to say we jettison our assumption and we end up with a conditional antecedent error consequent. Another very important type of argument form is the indirect argument uh, or the reductio ad absurdum, and there is a proof pattern equivalent to this, which is the indirect derivation. Now this is very important in our regular sort of communication, but philosophers love using the reductio, and it's uh, very common in mathematical proofs and important for computer scientists and so on. Now the reductio is very straightforward. If I want to show a statement phi, one way that I can show it is assume the very opposite of what I'm trying to show. So if I assume that not phi is true, the goal under this assumption is to show that such a, an assumption leads to a contradiction. It leads to some sort of absurdity. And if this is the case, it must be that my original assumption of not phi is false, which means that phi itself is true. And this is the reductio pattern. Now again, we see this all the time in philosophy, and uh, a nice example of this is the problem of evil. The problem of evil says, assume, let's suppose, that an all-powerful, all-good, and knowledgeable God exists. Well, under that assumption, I come to a, con a contradiction, and the contradiction is very straightforward. Such a being would not allow for evil in the world, but there is clearly evil in the world. Therefore, my assumption must be false. Such an all-powerful, uh, all-good, and knowing God cannot exist. And that's how the problem of evil is structured, as a reductio ad absurdum. So, what does a proof uh, in this sort of pattern look like? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If I want to show phi, one thing that I can do immediately is assume the opposite. I can do an indirect derivation and assume that not phi is true. Remember, once I start an assume ID, what I'm sort of looking for is some sort of contradiction. So what does that look like? Well, I would sort of begin by proof and do a lot of sort of automatic moves and arrive at some line later on. Call, let's call it psi. And if it turns out that I can also show not psi, I have a contradiction. Because surely, if I have a statement psi, and I also know not psi, and I know they're both true, that's impossible. That's a classic contradiction. So now what I can do in my derivation is point to those two lines and say that's contradictory. So I'll say 5, 6, ID. And ID stands for, hey, I've just done an indirect derivation because I've shown that a contradiction follows from my assumption. So I'm able to box off all the lines that led to my, uh, my contradiction, and I can say that I've successfully shown what I wanted to show all along. Why? Because the assumption ID led to a contradiction, which means line 2 must be false, so line 1, the phi, must be true. This argument has three premises, and my goal is to show not P. So if we start normally, I get show not p. And we have a problem. The problem is my only available lines here are premise 1, premise 2, and premise 3. I actually can't use line 1 at all because it's an uncrossed off show. So when I look around, the issue is I realize there's nothing I can do. I can't actually do anything to combine these three premises. They're all conditionals, and I don't have any antecedents or negation of consequence to do modus ponens or modus tollens. So what we need is a new available line, and this is why assume ID is so powerful. Now when I assume ID of show not P, technically uh, this means that I actually assume not not P. But there is a nice shortcut in our system which says when we do an assume ID, I can actually assume either the negation or peel away a negation, and this will be my assume. 
Now I'm not too worried about this for here. I'm just going to say, well, for convenience sake, I'll assume ID uh, my, my show not P to get P. Now remember, what this means is we're doing an indirect derivation. I want to show not P, so I will assume the opposite and show that it yields a contradiction. If I can find the contradiction, then I can do the proof successfully. Well, P is, of course, the antecedent of P arrow not Q, so I just get not Q immediately from two premise one modus ponens. Well, that's fine. This not Q obviously combines right here with premise two to get not R. Why? Because the not Q is the negation of the consequent, and so I can say premise two, uh, three modus tollens. You'll notice that sometimes I put the conditional as the first number, uh, and sometimes I'll put the antecedent or the negation of the consequent as the first. It doesn't matter. As long as you put both uh, sort of references in, it doesn't matter which order you put it in. Okay, so now I have not R. Well, I can clearly see that I have a modus ponens right here, uh, and that is four premise three modus ponens. Okay, so this is the end of all the automatic moves. I basically use all three premises in terms of modus ponens and modus tollens, and in the end I have this, a bunch of sort of atomics. Uh, I, I sort of casually treat the negations as atomics as well. But the key is that over here I have P, and over here I have not P. So this is a contradiction. A contradiction is always of the form phi and then not phi somewhere else. So it doesn't matter what phi is, as long as one is the negation of the other exactly, I have a contradiction. So this means that I can do an uh, a reductio ad absurdum. Under my assumption, I've led to a con contradiction, and so I can say on line two and five, I'm doing an indirect derivation. These are contradictory to each other, so that means I know my assumption is false, and my original statement is true. This is an indirect derivation. A really common question that is asked in the course is how do I know ahead of time whether or not I should do a direct derivation or a conditional derivation or an indirect derivation? And actually the answer is it turns out it doesn't matter. Uh, we are always allowed to start a derivation however we want and then we can finish it in a totally different way. And we'll sort of talk about this in class, why this is so, but our system allows for mixed derivations. So that's actually really nice. What it means is that you can attack a derivation in sort of a general way, and then just sort of wait and see what comes of it. So the most important skill that you will have to develop in derivations is going to be breaking down your show line. And because we allow for mixed derivations, uh, we can sort of approach our show lines in the same way every time, in a very uh, algorithmic way. So here's the pattern. Always, always, always look at your most recent show line that you wrote down. If it's a conditional, you immediately start a conditional derivation. If it's anything other than a conditional, we'll start an indirect derivation. Again, this works because we're allowing for mixed derivations, because what if I start an indirect derivation and then actually find exactly what I'm looking for, as in what if I find it, di it directly? Well, it doesn't matter. We can still finish the derivation any way we want. So in general, what your derivation should always look like is like so. If your show line is phi arrow psi, we assume CD and show the consequent, and then we finish the proof. If our show line is anything other than that, we'll just do an assume ID and then work towards uh, the final answer.